Well, this morning, I want to continue in the uh, series of Hosea lessons. I promised when I started the Hosea series that I would put periodic interruptions into it. Uh, I didn't plan on one of those interruptions being me getting sick, but that's the way it goes sometimes. Uh, so that was last week. But this week, what we're going to do is we're going to pick up in Hosea chapter 5. Uh, in Hosea chapter 5, in verse 8... And I'll really kind of go through 7 verse 7. And the lesson is titled, Refreshing Rain and Dissipating Dew. I almost called it Dissipating Dew, but then I thought, no, dissipating, that's not really, a, that, that, that sounds like a highfalutin word that nobody would really use in church. And then we had Bible class this morning on the dissipations of this world. I'll let you be the judge. Uh, clearly, clearly, not everybody agreed with me on that opinion. Uh, um, but this morning, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about really the kind of the problem of Israel is that judgment is coming on them and that God really wants them to repent. He really wants to save them. He really wants to heal them like a refreshing rain. But the people, they have no loyalty. They're more like disappearing dew. And to that end, I have uh, outlined this section in this way, and this may be a bit arbitrary on my part, but again, uh, Hosea is a difficult book to outline, so I'm always looking for ideas. And what we have here, of course, is, you know, we begin by talking about the judgment on Israel in verses 8 through 15. Uh, in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 6, we kind of raise the question of whether or not there is hope for Israel's healing, and it sounds actually very good. It's a statement of repentance, and it's so good, in fact, that it inspired a song that is in our songbook. Uh, which we will look at uh, in due course. Uh, then, of course, the C section in the middle, the lack of loyalty that Israel actually has. They are not going to be healed because they are not repentant. And so, as a result, in 611b through 72, God refuses to heal Israel, and we come full circle in chapter 7 to the judgment. That's the basic uh, skeleton, if you will, of what we're going to be looking at this morning. Now, beginning in verse 8, I'm going to talk about judgment. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Sound an alarm at Bethaven. Behind you, Benjamin, Ephraim will become a desolation in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I declare what is sure. The princes of Judah have become like those who move a boundary. On them, I will pour out my wrath like water. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment because he was determined to follow man's command. Therefore I am like a moth to Ephraim, and like rottenness to the house of Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria, and sent to King Jareb. But he is unable to heal you, or to cure you of your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear to pieces and go away. I will carry, and there will be none to deliver. I will go away and return to my place, until they acknowledge their guilt, and seek my face." In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. All right, so here we start with the, this blowing the trumpet, which could be variously interpreted as a call to battle or summons to worship, but really kind of, in this case, an announcement of judgment that's taking place. And God's judgment is really kind of personified in three ways here. Verse 10, it talks about pouring out His wrath like water, the first of many, many water analogies that we're going to see in this section of Hosea. Second, he talks about uh, being like a moth or like rot to Ephraim, uh, which it sounds kind of strange to us, uh, God comparing Himself to a moth or rot, depending on how you translate it. And then third, He compares Himself to a lion that's going to eat them in verses 14 and 15. Uh, now, we're talking about each of these things in turn. In verse 10, we're talking about God's wrath being like water. Later on, of course, God's going to talk about how you know, His healing of the people is going to be like a refreshing rain that comes upon them. But this is shows the double use of water in Scripture. Uh, water can be a good thing. It can be used for healing. It can be used to save people. We even use it to baptize people. It was used in the law of Moses for cleansing. But here, God pours out wrath like water. It's not a happy picture here. Water can also kill you. It can drown you. You take too much of it. You know, it can do damage. You know, how many homes do you know of that are destroyed by floods every year? You know, and God uses it in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9 to destroy the world in a flood. So water can be very dangerous as well. 
Second, verses 11 through 13, we're talking about the moth and the rot. You know, I, you know, you talk about judgments coming on you like a moth. That doesn't exactly invoke an image of terror in your head, does it? Uh, like in English, um, you know, we we think of maybe moths being things that eat your clothes. Uh, and in fact, the Bible occasionally mentions uh, moths eating garments, like in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 9, or 51 verse 8, or uh, a few times in Job. And added to that, of course, is the problem that uh, we're not really sure if moth is even the right way to translate it. Uh, suggestions range from things like rot to larva to puss. It's not a very happy sounding thing. Um, and so what, what we have here is kind of this interesting image where God compares himself to this, this vermin that gets into the people's sores and eats away at it. And you think, God is like that? What? Well, I mean, it's in the Bible. And God describes himself this way. The point is, of course, you know, God acts as a destroying agent. God will be the source of destruction for these people. Now, when God destroys something, does it always happen instantly? Does it always happen overnight? You know? I mean, the Bible certainly depicts a lot of cataclysmic stars falling from the sky, judgments, people hiding under rocks and begging the rocks to collapse on top of them. But sometimes God's judgment is more subtle than that. Sometimes God works in ways... You know, people, people get all on about God's providence and how, oh, you know, He slowly works to make things better for you. Sometimes He slowly works to make things worse for you. Maybe you're a bad person and He's doing it that way, doing that for a reason. He slowly creates decay. <coughs> and that's what he does for Israel here. He's going to be like a moth to them. You know, he acts as this destroying agent, this sickness, this infestation that slowly gets in and permeates and tears everything apart from the inside. But of course, that is balanced against the other image for God's judgment, the lion, the big scary lion. Well, now that's a little bit more familiar. Lions, we think of, uh, you know, if you're fighting against a lion, uh, it's going to be a much quicker battle, uh, and you're probably not going to last very long because the lion, uh, you know, will pounce on you and be very large and has teeth and claws. And, um, well, generally, of course, what happens, we have this more familiar image where God works fiercely like a lion instead of slowly or silently like the moth. And the result, of course, you know, I will tear to pieces and go away. I will carry away and there will be none to deliver. I will go away and return to my place. Here, the, the lion, he tears. But there's none to save. There's no shepherd to rescue the sheep from slaughter by the wild animal. Why, though? I mean, why is God so angry? Why does he want to do all these things? Well, you know, we could point to some of the other sins that have been highlighted in Hosea prior to this. You know, but... Just look here. Why? Well, first of all, verse 10, he mentions they've been moving boundaries. The princes of Judah have become like those who move a boundary. Uh, they didn't have fancy cartography back then. Uh, they didn't have Google Maps to tell them where every boundary line was located. Instead, what they used is they had these boundary stones, and where the stone was set up, that was the boundary between this nation and that nation, or between this, uh, this field and that field. But, of course, what would happen is because... Uh, people were greedy back then, which never happens today. Uh, people would take the boundary stones and they would move them when no one was looking. You know, they might go out in the middle of the night and they move the boundary stone. And, Ooh, now I have a little more territory, a little extra land, and they're none the wiser. Well, uh, such behavior is inherently dishonest, and it's actually condemned multiple times in Scripture. Uh, the law of Moses in Deuteronomy 19 and verse 14 condemns moving the boundary stone as a criminal activity. Deuteronomy 19, and verse 14, says, You shall not move your neighbor's boundary mark, which the ancestors have set in your inheritance, which you will inherit in the land that your Lord your God gives you to possess. Again, in Deuteronomy 27, in verse 17, the law of Moses proclaims, Cursed is he who moves his neighbor's boundary mark, and all the people shall say, Amen. It was inherently dishonest behavior, because you're cheating your neighbor, you're stealing from him. Uh, you know, people think, well, I didn't steal anything. I just moved a stone. Well, that's, not how, I mean, that's not how stealing works. You're doing it to gain an advantage from yourself and take something away from somebody else. That's stealing. You're trying to steal his land by moving the boundary stone. Um, you know, and some, some people try to associate that with a specific historical situation like Ahaz stealing land from uh, Jehoash or, uh, or some kind of Assyrian invasion to the north or uh, other things like that. I really don't know. 
Um, people always try to find the historical background to random statements that Hosea makes, and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Hosea is pretty cryptic, so um, if you want to think that, go right ahead. Um, Secondly, verse 11, Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment because he was determined to follow, and this is where it gets interesting, he was determined to follow blah, as I would translate it. Now the New American Standard says he was determined to follow man's command, but that's not the normal word for commandment there is the problem. And in fact, the word is sav, which is basically a Hebrew nonsense word. Like our English word bleh or blah. Um, the ESV has filth. The, N- the NASV has man's command. And the Net Bible has worthless idols. But they're all trying to translate the same. You know, This is a nonsense word, so they don't know what to do with it. Uh, well, I say render it as a nonsense word. They're following nonsense. Man's command, that's nonsense. Worthless idols, that's nonsense. Filth, that's nonsense. You know, it's a, it's a term that's it's actually used in uh, Isaiah chapter 28 as well when Isaiah starts uh, criticizing the people. You know, you you you're you know you're you're talking all this nonsense to us, and he uses a string of nonsense words in Hebrew, and this is one of them. Um, and thirdly, not only are they and yet they're so preoccupied with all this nonsense that doesn't matter. Uh, I guess it's basically you know, he's speaking prophetically about Facebook here. Clearly, is what he's doing. Well, I mean, you know, isn't that not what it is? Everybody's determined to follow blah and share blah with all my friends. You know? And then calling King Jerob for help. Who's King Jerob? <laughs> well, you know who we, what we know? You know how many king... You, there's no King Jerob in history that we know of. Uh, and in fact, what this probably is, is this is Hosea's nickname for somebody else. Um, and But exactly why he calls him this or which king he refers to is a little bit more difficult. Um, For one thing, Jerob is very similar to the word for lawsuit that was used in chapter 4. So some people translate it king contention. Uh, Others suggest a wordplay that Jerob means the great king. Um, But I mean, ultimately what it is, they're calling to a king that can't heal them. That's their problem. They're not calling on the Lord of hosts to save them. They're calling on this this great king that they've concocted for themselves. This king who will fight their battles. This king who, you know, if they just pay him enough tribute, then he'll help them establish their place in the ancient world. But of course, I mean, you know, you can read in 2 Kings 15, Menachem paid a huge tribute to the Assyrians, to the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III, one of the most powerful emperors in that time. And similarly, Ahaz, when he was in trouble with Israel, he called on the Assyrian emperor Tiglath-Pileser to try to come and save him. But over and over again, the prophets keep making the remark, Assyria cannot save you. Your foreign alliances, your military prowess, your strategic maneuvering, that's not going to save you from the coming judgment. And in fact, the very fact that you even trust these things is the reason for the judgment in the first place. You send to King Jerob, he's unable to heal you. He's unable to cure you of your wound. The oozing sores that God is infiltrating like a moth, like rottenness, they cannot be fixed by an appeal to foreign alliance. So what's going to happen? Well, verse 15 says God will withdraw from His people until they decide to repent and seek after Him. So will the people repent? Verses 1 through 3. Come, let us return to the Lord. For He has torn us, but He will heal us. He has wounded us, but He will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day, that we may live before Him. So let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. For His going forth is as certain as the dawn. And He will come to us like the rain. Like the spring rain watering the earth. (coughs) Now, if you were just to take verses one through three, and pull them out of the Bible, and you know, inscribe them on a uh, you know, like a cross stitch or something, that looks pretty good, right? It's a uh, it's a very happy sounding poem there. You could write a song about it, and in fact, we have number six twenty five in your books. Let us know, Jehovah is pretty much almost entirely taken from that text right there. Um, now, what do we do? What is this? You know, and there's disagreement about what this is doing here because God's talking about judgment and all of a sudden, oh, come let us return to the Lord. It's like the people are talking about repenting. Well, that sounds so good, right? 
And in fact, you'll notice there are a number of connections with what comes before. This is not just totally out of the blue. He picks up on previous terms and uses them again. So for instance, you know, when he talks about going to King Jerob and going to the, these other places and God going away, but they say in verse six, uh, in verse 1 of chapter 6, Come! Same verb. Let us return to the Lord. Verse 14, God talks about being a lion that has torn them. In verse 1 they say, but He's torn us, but He will heal us. You know, God, and talk, and they talk about how King Jerob is unable to heal you, but God is able to heal God wants them to seek His face. They wants them to come before Him. In verse 2, what are they doing? They want to live before Him. They want to live before His face. And of course, uh, He also talks about the need. Why did I write dawn there? Dawn is not in verse 15. Okay, well clearly I goofed something up. Alright, so there's... Well, we'll talk about dawn in a little bit, but... So the people are praying for, for healing in this instance. And what we have two interpretive options. Either this is what God wishes the people would say, or this is the people's actual statement and they don't mean it. People say this, but they're not sincere. <coughs> and in fact, the idea of self-serving, unsincere repentance has come up in Hosea before. Like in uh, chapter 2, verse 7, for instance, where the harlot said, Oh, I will go back to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. But he goes on to say she doesn't... (coughs) Excuse me. She doesn't know where these things are coming from. In fact, I would notice something. That the song meets a lot of the demands for repentance that we saw in those previous verses, but there's something missing. We're missing an actual admission of guilt. The people never once in this song confess their sins. They've faced their woundedness, but not their waywardness, as one writer put it. And in fact, what we have here is a situation where, and if you keep reading, it's clear what we have. We have a problem of insincerity in verses 4 through 11. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. Therefore I have hewn them in pieces by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But at Adam they have transgressed the covenant. There they have dealt treacherously against me. Gilead is a city of wrongdoers, tracked with bloody footprints, and as raiders wait for a man, so a band of priests murder on the way to Shechem. Surely they have committed a crime. In the house of Israel I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's harlotry is there. Israel has defiled itself. Also, O Judah, there is a harvest appointed for you. All right. And so you look at what's going on here. The people are saying, oh, God's going to heal us after three days. But in verse 4, God talks about... Well, in verse 5, God talks about slaying them with the breath of His mouth. It should say verse 5 up there, not verse 4. People talk about God's light going forth as certain as the dawn. But God says in verse 5, the judgments on you are as certain as the light that goes forth. The people say, oh, God is like a spring rain watering the earth, a refreshing rain. But God says, you people are like a morning cloud. You're like disappearing dew that goes away. Hence the title of this morning's lesson. Because what's the real problem here? Verse 6, I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. You think you can go through the motions? You think you can perform some magic ritual, say the incantation, and the Lord will just be okay with you? You think your heart doesn't belong in it? On the contrary, the Lord says, I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice. I delight in actually knowing God rather than just going through the motions and performing these Celtic rituals over and over. And if the claims of 1 1 through 3 were made by the people, they were insincere. God's goodness, God's goodness is dependable. It's like the spring rain. You can count on it. But Israel's loyalty, that's just a morning cloud. It's a vapor. It's here, and then it's gone. 
like James says your life is in James 4, and using the same kind of language here, that's what Israel's loyalty is like. It's shallow. And so they themselves will become like their loyalty, obliterated. Now, it's interesting here. He talks about slaying them in pieces by the prophets. You know, you kind of get the image of Samuel slicing Agag in a bunch of pieces. But then you get another image in your head from something Samuel said on that occasion in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, <clears throat> this is one of many allusions that Hosea makes to the story of Saul. Uh, he likes to do this actually quite a bit. But in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul has been told by the Lord, you've got to go, you've got to utterly destroy the Amalekites. You've got to wipe them out. You can't leave anything alive. You can't even bring back the livestock. Right? So, of course, what happens, Saul goes out and he kills most of the Amalekites. He brings back Agag alive. He brings back the livestock alive. And then Samuel comes to Saul and Saul's first words are, well, I have obeyed the commandment of the Lord. I've done what the Lord said. And Samuel goes, well, why do I hear the, the bleeding of sheep and the lowing of oxen? Oh, well, that was the people. They wanted to save some animals for sacrifice. And so they go back and forth for quite a bit, and Saul refuses to admit guilt. And finally Samuel says, you know what, the Lord's done with you. You're not going to be king anymore. And at that point, all of a sudden, Saul became very sorry because you know, he was going to lose something. Well, of course, you know, the main lesson that we see here in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22, what Samuel says, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. And, <laughs> excuse me, and to heed than the fat of rams. The rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has also rejected you from being king. You know what God cares about? Oh, well, God, I, I, I know I didn't do what you said, but I bought you a bunch of bonus gifts. God doesn't want your bonus gifts. He just wants you to do what He said. God doesn't need your extra gifts. He doesn't really need anything from you in the first place. He owns everything in the world and more besides. What he wants, what God really wants from his people is for his people to be loyal to him. To actually do what he says. To obey. To show steadfast love. To show covenant fidelity. And I mean, there's a whole host of passages in the Bible where God states his preference for loyalty over sacrifice. We're not going to look at them all. 200 years since Saul. Israel still doesn't get it. As Agag was hewn to pieces, Israel will be hewn by the words of the prophets. You know, I mean, is it that God hated sacrifice? No, God commanded sacrifice. It's all over Leviticus. But what happens? God wants something else more. He wants your heart. Sacrifice is easy. It's easy to burn animals. It's hard to actually change your heart and change your life. The Lord asked for the harder thing from us. You know, every other pagan god in the world, they want sacrifice, they want ritual, they want all these other things. You know, you say the right prayers, you perform the right rituals, you do the right things. But our God... Our God actually wants to know us and wants us to know Him. He wants a relationship with us. So why treat Him as no different from the gods of the pagans? Hosea, of course, he, he criticizes these rituals over and over again. But it raises some questions for us. What about our motive in worshiping God? You know, we talk about true worship versus false worship. What is false worship? False worship begins in the heart. You can have everything externally right and still be practicing false worship if your heart is not right with the Lord. You know, get the heart right, the externals fix themselves. Get the heart wrong, nothing is fixed. This passage is even quoted by Jesus in the New Testament on two different occasions. In Matthew 9, 13, and in Matthew 12, and verse 7. Um, one instance is Jesus is eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, and the Pharisees kind of criticize him for it. And Jesus says, well, go learn what this statement means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. 
Again, in Matthew 12 and verse 7, Jesus' disciples are going through the fields to pick in the grain heads on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, if you understood what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. If you understood the priority of mercy over ritual, you would not have condemned the innocent, he said in Matthew 12 verse 7. What do you think? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Just because we ain't offering actual animal sacrifices in our assembly today doesn't mean that statement doesn't have bearing on us. I mean, think about it and what that means for us. There's one other note I'll make before we pass on to the next section. Uh, In verse 7, it says, um, like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant, or possibly at Adam. And the idea here is that Adam is not... Uh, we, 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 we hear Adam, we so frequently think of the guy in the Garden of Eden who ate the forbidden fruit. But there was actually a place called Adam, too. And that fits the context of Hosea better here, actually. It's at Adam they have transgressed the covenant. The reason why is because Adam was a geographic location. Uh, it's mentioned in Joshua chapter 3 and verse 16 as the place where the Jordan River was stopped to let Israel over. And um, what happened, it would have been located between Gilead and Shechem. And you'll notice what's going on here. Like at Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherous with me. Gilead is a city of wrongdoers, tracked with bloody footprints. As raiders wait for a man, so a band of priests murder on the way to Shechem. And so the typical reconstruction of this is that uh, people were being killed between Gilead and Shechem on the road. They were being highway robbed or something. Um... Even though Shechem is a city of refuge where the priests are supposed to protect people, here the priests are participating in, or at least complicit in, the murder of people trying to find refuge. They take refuge in Shechem so they can get away with shedding blood. Sounds like the people have no loyalty. Sounds like they've broken the covenant. Yeah. (coughs) There's one other thing to note as we move into the next part. And that's, the, the Bible, I, I'm, I talk a lot about chapter divisions and verse divisions and how bad they are. This is one of the worst, I think. And here's why. Okay, so you read this. This is the division between chapter 6 and chapter 7. In the house of Israel, I've seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's harlotry is there. Israel's defiled itself. Also, O Judah, there is a harvest appointed for you when I restore the fortunes of my people. Well, now... And it sounds kind of awkward because, I mean, he's been giving warnings to Judah throughout the book. He says, oh, I've got a harvest for you, Judah, when I restore the fortunes of my people. And then you go on to chapter 7. When I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is uncovered and the evil deeds of Samaria. For they deal falsely. The thief enters in, bandits raid outside. He goes on and on and on. But, in fact, if you look at it, doesn't this line go here? When I restore the fortunes of my people, when I would heal Israel, you have that poetic parallel going on. And at the top, he ends the discussion of judgment by saying, Judah, there's a harvest appointed for you. You're not getting out of this so quick. The harvest is not a good thing. It's a bad thing here. Yeah, so this is, an interesting, uh, this is an interesting verse division. I think that this is kind of just recognizing this dis- dissipates some of the confusion that surrounds uh, these chapter divisions here. That said, I'll read this section now. When I restore the fortunes of my people, when I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is uncovered, and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief enters in, bandits raid outside, and they do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their deeds are all around them. They are before my face. And that's pretty short. The gist of that is that God wants to heal His people. But they've made it impossible because their sins are exposed. They made it impossible for God to heal them because they made it so their sin is just so flagrant, so unrepentant, so obvious. God, He can't heal them. He wants to, but the people are getting in the way. And when we move on, what's the end result? Verses 3 through 7 Judgment. With their wickedness they make the king glad, and the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers, like an oven heated by the baker, who ceases to stir up the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. On the day of our king, the princes become sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with scoffers, for their hearts are like an oven as they approach their plotting. 
Their anger smolders all night. In the morning it burns like a flaming fire. All of them are hot like an oven, and they consume their rulers. All their kings have fallen. None of them calls on me. Now, uh, there's a couple things here that are interesting to note. First of all, uh, the progression in verse 3 you know, we have the glad king, but by verse 7, they've destroyed the kings. You know, so it's kind of, we've, we've made the king glad, but not really because God is going to cause all their kings to fall because none of them called on him. The other weird thing we have here is this mixed metaphor of an adulterous oven. Um, most people, when they, they see an oven, you know, you compare somebody to an oven. Well, no, you, 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 tell, you call somebody an adulterer. Oh, just like an oven, right? Where did that analogy come from? I don't know. Uh, Hosea, Hosea likes weird analogies. I'm just going to go with that. Um, but the adultery image ties in with the rest of the book's theme of harlotry. In fact, this whole section, you'll notice, is dominated by ovens, heat, fire. Um, you know, the oven is heated by the baker. The princes are sick from the heat of wine, uh, literally is what it says. Uh, the hearts are like an are like an oven. The anger smolders. Fire explodes in the morning. Uh, or, you know, the New York Standard is milder. It says it burns like a flaming fire. You know, so all that talk about the refreshing rain earlier doesn't do you very good here. Um, you know, the people want refreshing rain, but because their loyalty was like a disappearing dew, now they get fire instead. When God pours out His wrath like water, what He's really pouring out on them is fire and brimstone. That does not sound fun. All their kings have fallen. And Israel's last days, if you know anything about them, 2 Kings 15 talks about political turmoil. Zechariah was killed by Shalom. Shalom was killed by Menachem. Menachem's son, Pekahiah, was killed by Pekah. Pekah was killed by Hosea. One conspirator after another hacks his way to the throne only to be murdered in response. They had four assassinations in 12 years in in this part of Israel's history. As one writer puts it, a row of tombs that memorialize the failure of royalty to provide peace, security, or stability. You want to put your trust in the king? You want to put your trust in the leaders? See what happens. See how far that trust gets you. You want to declare your loyalty to some misguided king of Israel? But you don't want to declare loyalty to God? We'll see how far that gets you. Because all their kings have fallen, but none of them calls on me, God says. And that is the saddest statement in this entire lesson. Verse 7. None of them calls on me. In chapter 6, it was all about, oh, come let us return to the Lord. But really, God says, none of them calls on me me we've tried so many solutions and none of them have worked we tried military invasion we tried calling the Assyrians for help maybe we can try calling the Egyptians for help we tried but we tried singing the song about God healing us we tried political conspiracy we tried offering sacrifices we tried everything in the world you know what you didn't do He didn't try God. He forgot to try God. And trying God, you know, even if the words, even if the words in 6, 1 through 3 came out of their mouths, come let us return to the Lord, that doesn't count. Why doesn't it count? Because it's just a pathetic, shallow statement of repentance. There's no acknowledgement of guilt. There's no determination of trust in the Lord. They think, oh, well, he's going to save us. We don't, we're not giving him any reason to, but he's going to save us. We don't have to follow his way. He'll just save us in the end. You know. It's like this profession that the world makes. So much of the religious world, they want everything to be easy. That's why, you know, oh, just say the magic prayer one time and you'll be saved forever. You know, you can live like a total heathen for the rest of your life. They can't take salvation away from you. That's not how it works. There's no passage in the scripture that even teaches that. But more to the point, you know, when, when did God ever portray himself as someone who doesn't care about his people's devotion to him? I've never seen that scripture. 
God has never said that. And here's the real bottom line to this. God's way has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found challenging and left untried. That's the real issue here that's at hand for all of us. You know what? You might read the Old Testament prophets. Some people might read the Old Testament prophets and think, oh, you know, God's just this big, angry, vindictive being in the high heavens who wants to smite all his people, is just waiting to catch them. And you have it so backwards if you think that way. Does God want to destroy his people? Does God want to devour them like a lion? Does God want to consume them from the inside out? Does God want to pour out fire upon them? Does he want to burn them? God doesn't want to burn you. He doesn't want to burn Israel. Look at him. He's frustrated. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? He says in verse 4. No. God wants to heal his people. He wants to save his people. He wants to refresh them. He wants to bring them back from the dead. Take out your song books as we're concluding the lesson this morning. So what's stopping God from saving everybody? What's stopping God from saving me? It has nothing to do with what God wants to do. God desires to save us. He desires that no man should perish. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the truth. All should come to repentance. It's not his ability either. He's God. Guess what? He can do anything. Because he's God. He made everything. So if it's not his desire that's in the way, and if it's not his ability that's in the way, what is in the way? It's our sin. Our stubborn refusal to repent, to acknowledge our guilt, to turn to the Lord. Our lack of loyalty. So what's the solution? continue the vain cycle of empty ritual? Or do we seek true, steadfast love and loyalty in our covenant with God? He has bent over backwards for us. He has done so much for us that we did not deserve. He sent His Son to die on the cross for us. You think God doesn't care? Oh, He cares. But learn what this means. I desire loyalty and not sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus may have satisfied the wrath of God, but He still desires your loyalty. Are you willing to give it to Him? And if you're here this morning and your loyalty to God has wavered, perhaps it has not been there, or perhaps you realize you just need to commit your life to the Lord. You need to be immersed for the forgiveness of sins or if some other way that we can help you this morning. Now would be an appropriate time to let it be known while we stand and while we sing.